Hey everybody, so today I thought I'd do something a little bit different and discuss the various people who at one point or another have been described as the fifth beetle. And in true YouTuber fashion, I'm going to be doing it through the tried and tested method of a tier list ranking system. Thank you to my patrons and those of you on YouTube who contributed and helped come up with all the entries. Now, before one of you comments this down below, I understand that there is no one fifth beetle, even though I think there is one person who actually does stand out above the rest. I recognize that the title of fifth beetle is actually a culmination of people from different facets of the beetles lives. I'm actually going to credit one of my patrons, uh, Christopher Newman, who had a great point about the concept of the fifth beetle. He writes, I think the thing about the fifth beetle is that it's actually a composite. George Martin in the studio, Mal Evans as support, Brian Epstein from the management side, Billy Preston as the glue at the end, and yes, even Yoko and Linda. The fifth beetle is a gestalt of all those people who play played an integral part in the story. Thanks, Chris. I thought that was a really good point. So please keep that in mind. The fifth Beatle is really just a silly moniker that can be allocated to several people that all contributed to the rich tapestry that is the Beatles. What I'm arguing here is who contributed the most. The higher up the ranking doesn't necessarily mean that person is more talented. It just means that they're a bigger part of the Beatles legend. I'm gonna sort these into four categories. So up first, we've got musical contributions, then production, followed by management team and image, and finally friends and family. But before we get to the list, a little life announcement. I recently quit my part-time job that I've been at for seven years, which is amazing. It means I get to make YouTube videos full-time and also means I'm gonna be talking about Surfshark VPN for a hot minute. These are pictures of surfing sharks created by AI. And this is Surfshark VPN, created by people who want you to have safe internet access wherever you go. Look, we're moving around again. We're going on trips. Everyone seems to be in Italy at the moment. <laughs> which means you'll be encountering a lot more public Wi-Fi. And if you're at an airport waiting an hour at the baggage carousel and you don't have a VPN connected to your device, there could be people actively trying to hack into the network and steal your personal data, 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 whatever. It's yours and it's personal and you don't want it stolen. But this is the kind of problem that can be resolved with a subscription to Surfshark VPN. Essentially, you become an anonymous and hard to trace online user, which in turn makes the internet a safer and more enjoyable place to be. But it's not just internet safety. Surfshark VPN also allows you to connect to an IP address to virtually anywhere in the world. So if a stream streaming service just took down your favorite show in your country, which let's face it, a lot of them are doing at the moment, chances are it'll be available in another country's equivalent service. It's incredibly easy to set up. I got mine working in under a minute and right now Surfshark has a really good deal on. By using my link in the description and promo code Elliot, you can get 83% off, which means that for a few bucks a month, you can be safe from the dangers of the internet and whatever the heck this is. Plus you're going to get three months for free. So what are you waiting for? Surfshark has a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you use it, don't really like it, it's no problem. You can just cancel your subscription and get your money back. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring. And now let's get to the list. Category number one, musical contributions. So first up, we've got Pete Best, pretty significant guy as Pete Best was a member of the Beatles for the longest time of anyone other than John, Paul, George or Ringo. He was their drummer for two years, but of course the other three had their own kind of closeness and sen sense of humor and Pete Best didn't really share in that. Plus his drumming just wasn't up to snuff. So he was sacked for Ringo. Even though that did transpire, it's kind of sad that it happened to him. He still was a Beatle for two years. So you know what, honestly, I've got to go ahead and just put in straight in the A column, A row, whatever you call it. Next up, it's a bit of a weird one as it's not just one person, uh, but the guys who started the Quarrymen with John Lennon back in 1956, uh, the collective Quarrymen, I'll call them. I think they deserve a mention just because even though none of the guys were in the Beatles, the Quarrymen is what eventually evolved into the Beatles. And for that, I think they scraped by with an E tier. Okay, next we have Stuart Sutcliffe, John's best mate from art school. The original fifth Beatle in a way, because he was literally the fifth person to join the band. So he was the fifth Beatle back in the day. Stuart was the band's bass player before he quit and Paul McCartney took over. He also just wasn't very good at playing bass, mainly sticking to the root notes of chords. Very different to Paul McCartney's bass playing. He was more there for his image and just cause John really liked having him around. Now, although he didn't play with the Beatles constantly, he did play with them for a span of 14 months. And like Pete Best was a proper member of the Beatles. Stuart was the first Beatle to adopt the mop top 
top haircut uh, that became synonymous with the band. Now, the person that inspired Stuart with that haircut is later in this list, but you know, that's a pretty significant claim to fame as then the rest of the Beatles, of course, beginning with George Harrison, started adopting that haircut. It's also something that further alienated Pete Best as his hair was too curly for that style and suddenly looked quite different to the other members of the band. So you know what, Stuart, you also deserve an A tier status from me. Okay, here's one you may not have heard of, Chaz Newby. So the story with Chaz is the first time the Beatles went to Hamburg to play, Stuart Sutcliffe decided he actually wanted to stay in Hamburg to focus on his art. So when the Beatles came back to England, they were short a bass player. Enter Chaz Newby. He played four gigs with them in December, 1969. He was asked by John Lennon to come to Hamburg for their second trip there, but Newby decided to stay in England to go to university. So it does beg the question, what would have happened if Chaz decided to stay on? Would he have become a proper member of the Beatles? Would he have been their bass player? It's probably too hard to say. So for now, I am just gonna give poor old Chaz a measly E-tier status. As four gigs with the Beatles is certainly not nothing, but also not much. Just realized as well, I forgot when the Beatles were the Silver Beatles before Pete Best, they played with a guy called Tommy Moore for a few gigs before he left in a bit of a huff because of John Lennon. And that followed Norman Chapman, who had only about three gigs with him as well. So I'm gonna put them both in the F tier column. Alrighty, here's one you may have heard of, Tony Sheridan. So Tony Sheridan's got a pretty interesting claim to fame as one of the two non-Beatles, the other being Billy Preston, to receive so Andy White was the drummer that George Martin hired to play on the Beatles' Love Me Do single after being unsatisfied with Pete Best's and then Ringo Starr's drumming. Something I don't think Ringo Starr ever really forgave him for. It's actually Andy White's version that you can hear on the Beatles' album Please Please Me and most published recordings of that song. You can tell it's Andy White's version if you can also hear a tambourine because that is poor Ringo on tambourine there. And given this credit on what was the Beatles' very first single, I mean, I think that earns him a D tier status at least. Here's another you may be familiar with, Jimmy Nickel. So during the Beatles' 1964 tour, at the height of Beatlemania, Ringo Starr became ill with tonsillitis. The Beatles were considering canceling the entire tour when George Martin suggested drummer Jimmy Nickel to fill in as a replacement. He played eight shows across the world and after his two week stint returned to complete obscurity, which kind of messed with his head a little bit, but he does have that claim to fame as being the only person who played with the Beatles at the height of Beatlemania, which is a unique experience known only to the four other Beatles. So I'm gonna have to say, C tier. Oh, and look who it is next. It's the boomer who will not shut up about anything, Eric Clapton. Famously providing the lead guitar solo on While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and then also being one of the few people who worked with all four Beatles at one point after the breakup, John Lennon also joked that they should bring in Eric Clapton to replace George Harrison after he briefly quit the band. Look, it's a really terrific guitar solo, and I get that he was involved in their lives for quite a while, particularly George's, but I still think he's a D tier fifth Beatle. All right, now we're talking. It's Billy Preston, everyone. Now, Billy Preston, who you probably all are aware of now, he first met and became friends with the Beatles on tour in 1962 and was then reintroduced to the band uh, during the Get Back sessions, where he became the only non beatle musician to be given a credit on a Beatles recording at the band's request for the song Get Back. It's the only time an artist was given credit as a co-performer with the Beatles after the band started recording as independent artists. So huge claim to fame. Like if you search anywhere on music streaming services, you can search the Beatles and there'll also be the Beatles with Billy Preston. I mean, come on. The credit was given because of the sheer excellence and presence that Preston had on the track. But it wasn't just the song Get Back. I mean, Billy Preston played on half the songs on Let It Be and two songs from Abbey Road. Combine this with the fact that John Lennon suggested that Billy Preston join the group as the fifth Beatle. I mean, I just like him in our band, actually. I like a fifth Beatle. And honestly, if the Beatles had continued as a band or if they had at least toured, I fully expect Billy Preston would have stayed on with them. So I'm gonna give him an A or, oh, geez. Jeez, is, is he an S tier? This tier ranking thing won't let me go halfway between. So just know that I think he's bordering on an S, but I am gonna put him in the A tier 
row. I don't know. What do you think? S tier or A tier? Sound off in the comments. Now we've got one more entry from the musical contributions category, and that is Jim Keltner. He's more of an honorary entry. I just want to shout him out because even though he never really worked with the Beatles while they were a band, he did work extensively with John, Ringo, and George Harrison as their drummer after the Beatles broke up. He played on about half of Lennon's albums and most of Harrison's, which made him known as the fifth Beatle of the 1970s. So I think he at least deserves a D or an E tier status. I'm halfway between these two. Um, I'm gonna go E tier, just cause it happened after the Beatles breakup, but we love Jim Keltner. We're part of the Jim Keltner fan club. That's a joke for a couple of diehard fans. Okay, we are now into the production category and look who's up now. It's none other than George Martin. I mean, I'm just gonna say it now, S tier, no question. If there was ever gonna be one singular fifth Beatle, it would be George Martin. That's my opinion. I think a lot of people would agree with me. Let me explain. Just the sheer amount of contribution to the Beatles music is staggering. First of all, he was the one producer who was actually willing to give them a chance because he saw real potential in them. Like he thought they sounded okay, but he really could see a lot of charisma and charm in the Beatles and made sure that the Beatles would be signed by EMI. On the Beatles' second single, Please Please Me, George Martin strongly suggested that the song be sped up from the dreary old tempo that it was to a more fast and peppy one, which all the Beatles realized was the best thing for the song and were a little bit embarrassed they didn't think of it themselves. And it then went on to be their first single in the US. I mean, he produced every single Beatles album except for Let It Be. And he composed half the tracks off of Yellow Submarine, which is technically a Beatles studio album. And it wasn't just that he produced the Beatles albums. It was that he was able to translate their musical ideas. The Beatles were not musically trained and did not have much in the way at all of a vocabulary around a lot of this. But George Martin was able to synthesize these desires and requests and turn them into the brilliant recordings we know today. He arranged several of the Beatles' beautiful vocal harmonies and really he was just the guy that helped mature them into even more gifted artists. The Beatles really trusted George Martin's suggestions to make songs better. For example, George Martin was the person to suggest a string arrangement on Yesterday, which was a huge deal at the time and unprecedented to have a pop or rock and roll band utilize a string quartet in one of their songs. That then allowed more arrangements from George Martin, such as on Eleanor Rigby and Within You Without You. And as good a piano players as several of the Beatles were, particularly Paul, there were still some songs that eluded their talent and George Martin had to step in, such as on In My Life, Lovely Rita, Rocky Raccoon. Paul McCartney said after George Martin died, if anyone earned the title of the fifth Beatle, it was George. From the day he gave the Beatles our first recording contract to the last time I saw him, he was the most generous, intelligent, and musical person I've ever had the pleasure to know. S tier, full stop, the guy's a legend. And going further, we have Jeff Emmerich, who you may know as the Beatles engineer for many of their albums. I've read his book, Here, There, and Everywhere, which goes into his experiences creating the Beatles albums. And while Whilst it is fascinating, you can tell it's very agenda driven with many kind words about his main man, Paul McCartney, and far harsher words about George Harrison, whom he really seemed to have it in for. But particularly for the albums Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, Emmerich was the guy who helped fulfill the sonic experiments that the Beatles were trying to create around this time. I mean, this dude is credited as the first guy to stuff a wool sweater in a bass drum to get that thumping sound from Ringo during Tomorrow Never Knows. <laughs> No one ever had ever put a towel or a sweater or anything like to, to, to get that sound. He also laid tea towels on the toms and the snares to just get a bit more of a softer sound. That was all Jeff Emmerich. Much to the frustration of the other stuffy engineers at EMI, Jeff Emmerich also innovated by close miking the instruments. Engineers had always put microphones quite far back. It was just customary, but Jeff Emmerich wanted to experiment by putting them closer to get a more robust sound out of them. And this is a practice that we now all take for granted, but Jeff Emmerich, at least at EMI, famously did it first. Essentially, he was another creative spirit like the Beatles and encapsulated that try anything ethos of the band that helped them to stretch the limits of what recording studios in the 60s could do. So for me, he gets a B tier ranking, no question. Now you may recognize this 
snappy dressed fellow. It is Glyn Johns, famous for being the man who was brought in to rescue the disastrous Get Back Sessions, later becoming the Phil Spector produced Let It Be, which Glyn Johns called a syrupy load of bullshit. There's not much else that Johns has a claim to other than being the most dripped out of anyone in Get Back. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to give him an E tier. Got on you, Glyn. And if I'm gonna be including Johns, I've got to include Phil Spector, I suppose, although I do it reluctantly as his contribution to the Beatles Let It Be is arguably a negative one, depending on the way you look at it. Although he did work with John and George on their first two post Beatle albums where he was much better utilized. But in terms of a fifth Beatle, nah, I'm gonna have to put him in F. Okay, next category, management, team, and image. And we're kicking things off with none other than the famous Brian Epstein or Epstein. I've heard both pronunciations from different reputable sources, but I'm gonna stick with Epstein. Famous for being the man who discovered the Beatles in the Cabin Club and worked tooth and nail to get them a recording contract. Many people attribute Brian Epstein as the fifth Beatle, including Paul McCartney from this quote I found in the Beatles Story Museum in Liverpool. So which is it Paul, George Martin or Brian Epstein? What Brian did is that he knew the Beatles were gonna be big. He knew they were a sensation. It was his job to make them more presentable. He got them out of their scrappy leather gear and into matching suits and even choreographing that bow that they did at the end of every performance. He was the enterprising fifth Beatle, meaning he stayed out of all creative decisions and left that up to the Beatles and George Martin and instead focused on their image and how they came across. Brian really pushed that whole four cheeky lads thing, which helped them to become beloved around the world, whether you were some rebellious kid or their grandparents. He arranged unprecedented merchandising deals and handled controversies when they came up, like the bigger than Jesus issue. I would say that in the early days, Brian probably was more involved than George Martin was, but once the Beatles stopped touring and discovered their own identity, Epstein became a lot less valuable to them. I would say he's a strong A tier verging on S, but I mean, to me, he just can't beat George Martin. So if I could put him halfway between the two, I would, but for now I've got to just plonk him in the A tier column. Row, sorry, it's a row, not a column. People get annoyed with that. All right, next up we've got Mel Evans. And if you've seen Get Back, he's probably become a renewed favorite for a lot of people with his friendly, gentle giant nature. So he was a bouncer working at the Cavern Club uh, when Brian Epstein actually hired him as a roadie slash bodyguard for the Beatles. And he stayed on with them until the Beatles broke up in 1970. He, along with Neil Aspinall, another roadie from Liverpool, were the only other two people allowed in the recording studio when the Beatles were making music. They were part of what's called the Beatles in a circle. And Mal was the man who any of the Beatles could ask to get them a snack, a pair of socks, or just about anything, as you can see in Get Back. Mal, have you got my acoustic, Martin? And a package of ciggies, Mal. He contributed to a couple of Beatles tracks, including the Anvil on Maxwell's Silver Hammer, and a couple of organ parts on You Won't See Me, and even contributed a few small lyrics to songs like Fixing a Hole, and famously provides the countdown on A Day in the Life. Overall, I think this firmly lands him in the B tier row. Yeah. Good on you, Mal. And naturally following on from that, we have Neil Aspinall, a school friend of McCartney and Harrison. And similarly to Mal, Neil was originally hired as a roadie, which then progressed to a road manager, driving the Beatles wherever they need to go. Then he became their personal assistant. And after Brian Epstein died, he briefly served as the Beatles manager. And from 1970, all the way till 2007, the year before he died, Neil Aspinall was the CEO of Apple Corps, overlooking all marketing, video, and merchandise and decisions, which means his business was the Beatles from the 60s all the way up to his death. George Harrison said in 1988, when inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that either Neil Aspinall or Derek Taylor, who I'll be discussing next, are the two people worthy of the title of Fifth Beatles. So I'm gonna have to say... A tier. All right, now we have Derek Taylor. Originally hired as the Beatles press agent and Brian Epstein's assistant, Derek Taylor moved further into the Beatles inner circle as the years went on, where he eventually became press officer for Apple Corps. He contributed uncredited lyrics on two White Album songs, Happiness is a Warm Gun and Savoy Truffle. And like I just said, he was credited by George Harrison as the co-fifth Beatle with Neil Aspinall. But I would put him in the B or even C tier column. Here's one you may not know, uh, Douglas Millings. Known for designing, among other clothes for the Beatles, their famous collarless suits, but 
I don't know, this is a pretty weak claim to fame for the fifth Beatle. So yeah, E tier. Okay, final category, friends and family. And we're beginning with one of my favorite uh, Beatle adjacent people, Klaus Vormann. So Klaus was the first guy the Beatles knew who wore what became the mop top look, which was actually at the time how a lot of French and German art students wore their hairstyles. He was the guy who saw the Beatles playing in Hamburg and convinced his girlfriend Astrid Kircher to check them out as well. She was actually the one who gave George Harrison the very first Beatles haircut to match Klaus and then John and Paul followed. She also took those famous black and white photos of the band as well around that time. But Klaus, Klaus played bass uh, for the band for a few gigs when Stu Sutcliffe couldn't and also went on to stay in the Beatles lives, living with Ringo and George in London and designing the famous Revolver album artwork, which he won a Grammy for. And honestly, like when you're talking about album artwork, apart from probably Sgt. Pepper or Abbey Road, there's little that's as iconic as the Revolver artwork. He also played on nearly every post Beatle album for John, George and Ringo. I mean, that alone definitely earns him a B tier status. Okay, only a few to go now. We have DJ Murray the K. So if you don't know who this guy is, he was a New York disc jockey who was actually the first person to ever be called the fifth Beatle. I got one more week of this and I'm gonna become the fifth Beatle, baby. So the story is on February 7th, 1964, the Beatles fly into New York City for the first time and you've got DJ Murray the K waiting at the airport to greet them. And then he kind of just took over their made in US press conference. Soon he was traveling with them, rooming with them, the other members of the press were getting really pissed off because they weren't getting in on any of this Beatles action. In Washington DC, one frustrated reporter is said to have asked, what the fuck is Murray the K doing here? And George Harrison calmly replied, Murray's the fifth Beatle. And that honor alone gets him a C tier status from me. And now we move into someone you may have heard of, Bob Dylan. Why I've put Bob Dylan in this list is because he introduced them to pop in 1964. Forever changing their lives and their approach to music, which is Huge. I mean, I suppose you could also put the dentist that slipped LSD into George and John's coffee, but I uh, know we're getting away from ourselves here. Now, Bob Dylan was not only a contemporary, but his sound was hugely influential on the Beatles around Help Rubber Soul that era, when they were really getting into folk music properly. But at the same time, he wasn't a part of the band in any significant way. And, you know, many, many people influenced the Beatles, really. So I'm going to go and pop him in. What do you think? D or? E tier. Uh, just looking at the rest of the Ds, I'm gonna put him in E. Sorry, Bob. Again, this isn't a reflection on Bob. D Bob Dylan isn't an E tier person, but in terms of his contribution to the Beatles, E. All right, the penultimate entry is Yoko Ono. Now, a lot of you out there might be rankled for me just including this, but the credits speak for themselves. Putting aside just how much of an influence Yoko was to John Lennon's songwriting from 1968 onwards, she's also the only non beatle to share co-lead vocals on any Beatles song. That song, of course, being the continuing story of Bungalow Bill. <laughs> Not one of the Beatles' best songs, but a decent credit nonetheless. The song The Ballad of John and Yoko is obviously about her and John, and honestly, just the proximity she had to the band in their last couple of years, how she instantly became part of their inner circle, I mean, I think that earns her a D tier status. Come for me, come for me. Let me have it in the comments. And finally, we have Apu Nahasapima Petalon. Now, Apu claimed to be known as the fifth Beatle back in the days where the Beatles were hanging out in India. Back then I was known as the fifth Beatle. Sure you were, Apu. Although Paul would dispute this, so sorry Apu, I'm just gonna have to put you in the F tier column. We've only heard it from you, dude, so can't really take this one that seriously. Oh, along with Alan Klein. You can go in F as well, you bastard. So that's my list. I hope you enjoyed it. If you disagree or if there's someone that I somehow missed, feel free to pop it in the comments, but please keep it friendly, everyone. Thank you to my patrons for supporting me. And just a reminder, you can become a patron right now. The link is in the description. You get tons of bonus content. Uh, it'll be worth your time. Otherwise, you know, give it a like, hit subscribe, have a cup of tea. Enjoy that sweet Surfshark VPN discount and I will see you next time.